Welcome to the American College Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Frontline Surgeons Voices. With me today are two leading surgeons from McGill University in Canada, Dr. Leanne Feldman, the department chair, and Dr. Marilise Boutros, who I'm proud to say is one of our alumni from Cleveland Clinic, Florida in colorectal surgery. Welcome to From the Front Lines. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you both here. What I'd like to discuss with Dr. Feldman and Dr. Boutros today are ERAS protocols. Dr. Feldman was one of the driving forces in ERAS protocols being created and, and being disseminated. So I'd like to start with her and, and ask you, Dr. Feldman, what, what are some of the more important elements, most important elements of, of ERAS protocols? I think one of the most important elements is, uh, is, is, is the surgical aspect. So minimally invasive surgery is really one of the main uh, building blocks. And then there are multiple other elements of really evidence-based uh, perioperative care. So how do we prevent nausea and vomiting? How do we take care of pain without just giving someone a whack of opioids? Uh, prevent ileus, have people stay physically active, uh, not starve people and keep them in bed. Uh, not overload them with fluids, but give the right amount. Those are, those are all uh, really important elements. And I think one of the key elements is, is engaging patients and their families and caregivers uh, in participating with what might not be what they thought of traditionally as the usual, uh, what's gonna happen to them after an operation. Okay, so it, it impacts a lot of facets of, of care, therefore it probably involves a lot of caretakers. Who is responsible for the protocol in a given hospital? It could be McGill, it could be elsewhere. Who, who are the necessary people or teams involved? Right, that's a great point. I mean, traditionally we're very siloed in the way we take care of patients around surgery, but I think the shift in ERAS is, is really engaging with the idea that having major surgery, it's a very complex intervention. And even if this was one of the main uh, aha moments for me as a surgeon and someone interested in surgical techniques and minimally invasive surgery was the idea that you could do the most perfect operation in the world, but if you're not getting the same kind of enhanced recovery, anesthesia, nursing, nutrition, and so forth, then your patient's not gonna get the maximal benefits even if you do the perfect operation. So the stakeholders are really, um, you know, our colleagues in anesthesia, our colleagues in nursing, uh, our experts in pain management. And then I would even bring in some of the newer ideas, which is really the role of physical activity and exercise and the pre, pre-operative or prehabilitation piece as being maybe some of the more uh, newer or more innovative uh, aspects of, uh, of ERAS. Well, thanks very much. Let, let's turn to Marilis and, and ask Dr. Boutros, uh, you recently published a study, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your findings in that study, or even backtrack and tell us what was the impetus to perform that study. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Wexner. So um, our Haas, we learned ERAS from Dr. Feldman and her group, and we implemented ERAS at our hospital two years prior to the study that we published. Dr. Uh, Giulio Fiore, um, a researcher working with Dr. Feldman and myself, um, <clears throat> developed a standardized discharge criteria that were internationally accepted. So we said, since we're a new program, let's audit what we've done. Are we doing a good job and what are we doing? And so the endpoint in our study was this uh, va variable called time to readiness to discharge. So have patients met criteria for discharge and have they gone home essentially? And what we found is that in over a third of patients, they meet criteria, but they end up staying uh, a median of a day extra uh, in hospital for either physician beliefs that they're just not recovered enough or like Dr. Feldman was saying, the mindset that the patients and the families have that they're not quite ready to go home. And the third big reason was the infrastructure within the care system to go to a proper rehab bed et cetera, if they needed um, other types of care. So that really was the impetus to go to administration in our hospital and say, you know, we need to improve this trajectory of care. And that's what we were working on when COVID hit. Okay. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about any obstacles you might have encountered either within hospital personnel, clinicians, administrations, or, or the patients. 
Absolutely. So uh, we were lucky that we did start off with a good multidisciplinary team. Uh, anesthesia was fully on board, nursing uh, administration was on board. But when we first implemented, the nursing staff, for example, would tell the patients, well, you're not well enough for food right now. You know, just stick to your clear liquids. They would actually change our orders. Um, so, and that was a good for the first year, I would say. And then the next is really physicians. They were even harder to change because, you know, well, my patient's having a low anterior resection syndrome, for example, which won't go away in a day or two. So they're having frequent bowel movements. They can't manage at home or low grade fever or things that, you know, you just want to keep an eye on. So about 40% of our delayed discharges were due to physician beliefs that the patients weren't quite ready to go home. If they're having frequent bowel movements, not ambulating enough, things that were not clinically really warranted, but for physician comfort. And so definitely changing our mindset as physicians is even harder than changing our colleagues' mindsets, I'd have to say. COVID really changed things because patients want to leave. Their family members are not allowed in. Um, a lot of our patients do not speak English, French, uh, or any of the languages we speak, so they're quite isolated on the ward. Um, so the families are now wanting them to go home and physicians want them to go home because we need to empty the beds and we don't want them at risk in the hospital. So it's a real opportunity to fine tune our program. And what were your key findings from the study? The key findings were at 37% of our patients were staying a, an extra day uh, due to, again, these system and physician and patient beliefs. Um, and when we looked at our compliance between a two ERAS in the delayed group versus the uh, pa patients who went home on time, we actually didn't find any difference in compliance. The overall compliance to ERAS in our program is about 70%, so we have some room to go. We also found that the patients who went home at, at the at, on the day they met discharge criteria didn't have any increased visits to the emergency room, to the clinic, or any increased rate of complications, of course, compared to the people who stayed a day extra. So the extra day doesn't really seem warranted. Um, it just seems that we have some fine tuning to do in over a third of our patients. Thanks very much, Dr. Boutros. And, and Dr. Feldman, Dr. Boutros mentioned COVID. Um, and, and here we are now almost a year into this pandemic. Uh, Dr. Boutros already mentioned the problem with patients in hospitals. What is the difference of ERAS or the importance of ERAS perhaps in the era of COVID versus pre-early 2020? Right. Um, I think Dr. Boutros you know, brings up a good point that I think patients and their families are, are highly motivated to uh, decreased time in hospital for various reasons. And uh, we also have limited capacity uh, for these more urgent types of cases that are prioritized despite the pandemic. So this, this uh, as Dr. Boutros characterized it, I think is, a, is an opportunity to, uh, in a way, go to our ERAS, ERAS 2.0, uh, <laughs> which um, really continues to ask the question is what is keeping a patient in hospital uh, today and why do they have to stay in the hospital? So we've uh, begun um, um, even uh, implementing uh, same day discharge after um, after even uh, co colon resection or uh, anterior resection in selected patients. Um, and uh, I mean that takes uh, that that takes uh, really good surgery, uh, good anesthesia. A motivated patient. We've also um, uh, have a, uh, a messaging uh, app that uh, we can use to make sure that patients can uh, receive uh, uh, information uh, when they need it, and so that 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 they feel uh, taken care of. Um, but uh, I think you it, it really uh, makes us think about what why we keep patients in hospital. Uh, even even after one day, even when you have a patient, if you have patients, I think particularly that are that are in that category of that 23 hour type of stay, uh, those might be patients across the spectrum. So uh, same for upper GI surgery, uh, so parasophageal hernias or myotomies, uh, those types of things. It's kind of similar to when we started doing lap coli right at the beginning when before patients would come in the night before and stay another night and then at some point, we, it, it became clear that why were we keeping patients in hospital? Um, and it's, it's normal to us now that these procedures are, are ambulatory. 
And I think we'll see more and more complex surgery go that way as well. So we're working on uh, you know, some of our bariatrics procedures, even some of our thor thoracoscopic procedures, so vest procedures, uh, as I mentioned. So I think we're, we're excited about uh, the, next, uh, uh, the, the next level of uh, enhanced recovery. Thanks very much. In, in addition to the next level, there's also the next set of specialties or procedures where, where your ass might be applicable. And as present elective stages, you represent all of, of minimally invasive surgery. You already mentioned uh, foregut surgery and Dr. Boutros being a colorectal surgeon, uh, discussed that aspect. Where else besides the gut is, is uh, and you mentioned thor thoracic surgery, where else is ERAS applicable? Well, certainly in, in orthopedics, um, we see our colleagues uh, with same-day arthroplasty. Um, again, uh, really multidisciplinary, uh, working with, uh, with nerve blocks and ambulatory nerve blocks that patients go home with these baby bottles of uh, 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 so local anesthesia and, and blocks that uh, provide the kind of pain control that's necessary. So these are things that uh, uh, take, you know, take an organization, take everybody being on the same page. Um, it's a lot, I think it, one of the big leaps is that this is not a standard order set or something like that. It's really getting everybody on the same page who touches a patient having this complex intervention. And there are 20, 30, 40 people involved when a patient has, has surgery and all of them um, working together to, to figure out the pathway that's gonna work in a specific hospital. And I think what Dr. Boutros uh, also uh, is demonstrating is that it's not a one size fits all. So um, the, the concepts are applicable, but then the way you tweak it uh, really depends on uh, what, what works in your particular institution. And I think that's in a way the secret sauce of it is, is getting your a multidisciplinary group together and working on your on how you're gonna do it and making it your thing, and there's that ownership and pride in, in, in really improving care for patients and really seeing the results. Thanks very much, greatly appreciated. Um, let's ask Dr. Boutros then to, to uh, wrap up. What is the next frontier for your research? Uh, Dr. Feldman just gave you a whole variety of options. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you next going to focus your, your queries? Yeah, she definitely did. A few things that we uh, started to work on are prehabilitation. Um, we have our population is quite frail, uh, the, the population that we cater to at our hospital. And so we started to implement uh, prehabilitation with Dr. Franco Carly. And we haven't been able to demonstrate a decrease in complications yet. We're finding that there is improvement in their overall physical well being. And so that's something that we don't have our own program implemented yet. That's a direction that we definitely want to go to. Uh, you both had mentioned at the beginning, uh, op opioid screening and opioid sparing. I think that's something that we still have a lot of headway to uh, make. And that's a focus of one of our next research projects at our institution, again, as an audit and an improvement project. So these are some of the things that we'll be working on in the near future. And what COVID has brought us to is, again, sending patients home earlier and, um, again, using phone calls and online ways to do follow-ups, virtual post-operative visits. You know, sometimes you don't need to see them if there is no problem. Well, thanks so much, both of you. You've given us a great overview of, of where we started with ERAS, why it's been implemented, the benefits of it, and, and where we're heading in the future. Uh, I wish you both continued safety in the pandemic, and hopefully at some point we'll get to see each other in person again. Oh, yes, we will. We will for sure. Looking forward to it. Looking forward.